Hello, and welcome to Grand Dukes of the Center, Part 1, The House of Luxembourg. Today we're going to be starting a mini-series of supplemental episodes covering some of the most important families of the Holy Roman Empire and Central Europe. In this series, I plan on covering the House of Luxembourg, the Wittelsbach House of Bavaria, and the Habsburg House of Austria. I know we haven't spent much time focusing on Burgundy lately, but with the Nicopolis Crusade featuring a Luxemburger King of Hungary, and with our next narrative episode featuring a Luxemburger King of Germany, I figured that now would be a good time to get introduced to the family. And unlike the Nicopolis miniseries, this one will be fairly spread out. The House of Luxembourg has its roots, unsurprisingly, in Luxembourg. And the rulers of that small county on the western edge of the Holy Roman Empire really rose to prominence in the beginning of the 14th century. But we can't actually start today's story in Luxembourg. Rather, we first need to visit Bohemia. Bohemia, today roughly the western half of the Czech Republic, had been ruled by the Premislid dynasty since the 800s. The kings of Bohemia also ruled over the Margraviate of Moravia, roughly the eastern half of the Czech Republic, and some of the other surrounding territories. The Premislid king, Wenceslas II, was a strong monarch who, throughout the course of his reign, strengthened the Bohemian crown and began the process of re-establishing the power and prestige of Bohemia, which had waned somewhat in the years before he came to the throne. Silver was discovered in Bohemia during Wenceslas II's reign, further increasing the resources that the king could draw on. Wenceslas also looked outward towards Poland and Hungary. He was able to build up a power base in Poland throughout his life and eventually was elected king of Poland as well. Not only that, but when the Arpad line in Hungary died out, Wenceslas pressed the claim of his son, also named Wenceslas, as a candidate to be king of Hungary. But Wenceslas did not have the only claim to the Hungarian crown. Charles Robert of Anjou also had a claim and was willing to back that claim up with force. So the young Wenceslas III was forced to call on his father for help, and the two decided to regroup in Bohemia. However, Wenceslas II died of disease before another campaign could be launched, and his son decided to consolidate power in Poland and Bohemia and renounced his claim to Hungary. Then Wenceslas III was assassinated barely more than a year into his rule, ending the premisal line. Wenceslas's brother-in-law, Duke Henry of Carinthia, was designated as his successor. However, Henry of Carinthia's claim to the throne was nothing special, and the Habsburg king of Germany, Albert I, conspired to put his son on the Bohemian throne. Albert would not have longed to enjoy his newfound influence over Bohemia, as his son also died about a year into his reign, and Henry of Carinthia was able to take back control of the kingdom. Henry's position was then strengthened by the assassination of Albert by his nephew, but the death of one potential rival for Bohemia only opened the door to another. Henry of Carinthia was generally seen as a weak king and had many enemies in Bohemia who didn't go away simply because Henry's rival king was now dead. With the assassination of the Habsburg king of Germany, the electors of the empire got together to choose a new monarch. As this period saw the princes of the German empire doing their best to avoid creating another strong dynasty, it was unlikely that another Habsburg candidate would be elected. The two leading candidates to become the next king of Germany were Rudolf, Count Palatine of the Rhine and a member of the House of Wittelsbach, and Charles of Valois, brother to King Philip IV of France. The German princes were not over-eager to be ruled by the brother of the French king, but Philip had been playing the long game and had ensured that the three archbishop electors, Cologne, Mainz, and Trier, had been filled by candidates friendly to France. The Archbishop of Trier was the younger brother of Henry, the Count of Luxembourg, and the brothers decided to use opposition to French expansion to their benefit and put Henry forward as a compromise candidate for King of Germany. As a vassal of the King of France who had spent much time at the French court, Henry was amenable to the pro-French faction, and as he was not a member of the royal family, he was amenable to the anti-French faction. Eventually, the brothers were able to get almost all of the electors on side, with the exception of Henry of Carinthia, and so Henry of Luxembourg was elected Henry VII, King of Germany. But speaking of Henry of Carinthia, his position in Bohemia continued to deteriorate, and his control over the kingdom had just about disappeared. A collection of Bohemian nobles and clerics, specifically Cistercian abbots, 
approached Henry of Luxembourg to seek his backing in selecting a new king. Henry VII thought that his son John was a perfect candidate to be king, so John was married to Elizabeth of Bohemia, a daughter of Wenceslas II, and a few months after the wedding, Henry of Carinthia was kicked out of Bohemia. So within just a few years, the House of Luxembourg went from being the lords of a small county to holding the crowns of Germany and Bohemia. Just as John was getting settled in Bohemia, Henry decided to journey across the Alps to Italy to restore imperial authority to the peninsula. Without getting into an hour-long tangent about the political fragmentation of Italy and the complicated relationship between Italy and the empire, I do want to mention that in the years since the death of the Hohenstaufen Emperor Frederick II in 1250, the imperial presence in Italy had basically disappeared. Over the course of the Middle Ages, Italy had been roughly divided into two camps, the Guelphs, who generally supported the church, and the Ghibellines, who supported the empire. At this point, though, the main policy position of the Guelphs was opposition to the Ghibellines, and vice versa. But the old alignments still did carry some weight. Henry wanted to be the first king of Germany to be crowned emperor since Frederick II, and to do that, he needed to go to Rome and meet up with the Pope. The Pope, Clement V, had agreed to crown Henry, and so one big hurdle had already been surpassed. But now he had to reach Rome, and it was a long journey south. Henry's procession started off strong, Another of his aims was to facilitate peace between the Guelphs and the Ghibellines, and at first he was able to receive embassies from both parties while maintaining an even-handed posture. Once he reached Milan, he received the Iron Crown of Lombardy and became King of Italy, but there his troubles began as well. The Guelph leader of Milan, Guido della Torre, had forced the leader of the Ghibellines, Matteo Visconti, out of Milan about a decade earlier, and in the spirit of reconciliation, Henry invited Visconti and the other exiled Ghibellines back. Della Torre, however, did not look kindly on the political return of his rival, and, being a Guelph, was already predisposed to taking an anti-imperial position, and so he organized a revolt. The revolt was put down without too much issue, but in pacifying the city, Henry placed Guido Della Torre under the imperial ban and made Matteo Visconti the imperial vicar of Milan. In doing this, Henry became firmly identified with the Ghibelline faction and could no longer present himself as a neutral party who was just trying to restore peace. For the rest of his life, Henry would be vehemently opposed by the Guelphs. Immediately after the revolt in Milan was put down, several other Guelph-dominated cities in Lombardy rose up. These too were put down, but now the more powerful Guelph city of Florence and the Guelph-aligned Angevin king of Naples decided to oppose the Luxemburger. On his way to Rome, Henry learned that Pope Clement V was now unwilling to crown him. As the king of Germany and Italy further alienated the Guelphs of Italy, they petitioned the Pope to turn away from his previous support, and Clement now saw his interests better served through opposition to the empire. But Henry was already on his way, and so resolved to get crowned emperor in Rome with or without the Pope. Henry was crowned by two cardinals in the Lateran, as the traditional place of coronation, St. Peter's Basilica, was controlled by Neapolitan soldiers. Henry thus became the first Holy Roman Emperor since the death of Frederick II over 60 years earlier. After getting crowned, Henry's position in Italy was just about as bad as it was before, so the next year he continued his campaigns against the Guelphs. A little over a year after he had been crowned, Henry died of disease while on campaign. In the end, the most significant thing to come out of Henry's time in Italy was the return of Visconti power in Milan. So now that the king was dead, a new one had to be chosen. John of Bohemia may have been an obvious choice, but he was quite young at the time of his father's death, and the electors of the empire still wanted to avoid creating another dynasty. The two leading candidates for king were thus Ludwig, the Wittelsbach Duke of Bavaria, and Frederick, the Habsburg Duke of Austria. Knowing that they couldn't swing the vote in their favor, the Luxembourg electors, King John of Bohemia and Archbishop Baldwin of Trier, decided to support the Bavarian candidate over the Austrian. Ludwig was elected by John of Bohemia, the Archbishops of Mainz and Trier, the Margrave of Brandenburg, and the Duke of Saxony, Lauenburg. Meanwhile, Frederick was elected by the Count Palatine of the Rhine, who, despite being the brother of Ludwig, no longer got on with him the Archbishop of Cologne, the deposed Henry of Carinthia in his former role as King of Bohemia, and the Duke of Saxony-Wittenberg, who also claimed the Saxon vote. Ludwig was crowned at Aachen, the traditional place of coronation, while Frederick was crowned by the Archbishop of Cologne, who traditionally had the right to crown the King of Germany. 
so all told, it was hard to say who was the rightful king of Germany. But for now, I'll leave the rival kings to fight it out while we return to John of Bohemia and the House of Luxembourg. While Henry was in Italy, he made John his vicar in Germany, but again, John didn't have long to immerse himself in that role. As the conflict between the kings heated up, John's support of Ludwig the Bavarian ended up being instrumental in Ludwig's eventual victory. For his assistance, John received the imperial fief of Eger, modern-day Cheb, as well as an agreement from Ludwig to recognize any conquests that John might make. And so John decided to make use of that promise. He fought some conflicts on the borders of Bohemia and gained some territory at the expense of his neighbors. Internally, John made some attempts to expand the power of the crown, but these were ultimately unsuccessful. His position was better than that of Henry of Carinthia, but that was a pretty low bar to surpass. John was widely seen as a foreign king, which admittedly he was, who took little interest in Bohemia, which admittedly he did not. In fact, for most of his reign, John wasn't in Bohemia at all, but rather was traveling around as a knight errant. So whenever John did try to impose his will over Bohemia, he was widely opposed and found that his supporters were few and far between. In fact, John's position was so weak that at one point he arrested his wife Elizabeth and young son Wenceslas because he was afraid that Elizabeth would depose him and rule as regent for their son because she, well, took actual interest in the affairs of Bohemia. But realizing that Elizabeth was much more popular than he was, and that she wasn't actually planning anything, John relented and released his family. He did, however, send his son to live at the French court, to get him out of the country, but also to get him acquainted with some of the power players of the day. And speaking of getting out of Bohemia, John once again left his kingdom to become a knight errant. John fought all over Europe, and took a special interest in Italy, hoping to gain control over some parts of Lombardy. However, his campaigns in Italy would be no more successful than his father's were. In his claim of Bohemia, John also gained a claim on the crown of Poland. While he was ultimately unable to become king of Poland, John was able to peel the territories of Upper and Lower Silesia away from Poland. Silesia had occasionally been ruled by Bohemian kings in the past, but under John it became officially incorporated into the crown of Bohemia, and the king of Poland renounced all rights to it. As the relationship between Poland and Bohemia normalized, things in the empire were heating up. During the 1330s, the relationship between John and Ludwig began to deteriorate. The Holy Roman Emperor did not approve of John's excursions into Italy, and now began to look for ways to hem the House of Luxembourg in. Upon the death of Henry of Carinthia in 1335, his lands in Carinthia, Carniola, and Tyrol were supposed to go to his daughter, who was married to a son of John, but Ludwig declared the feast vacant, and instead split them between the Habsburgs and himself. Furthermore, as the Hundred Years' War had began, Ludwig looked to align himself with England, while John had been a long-time supporter of France. But the conflict between the Wittelsbachs and the Luxembourgers would not begin just yet. Likely because of the influence of his uncle, the Archbishop of Trier, John ended up reconciling with Ludwig, although the tensions between the two houses remained high. However, a few years later, competition between Ludwig and John for control over contested lands in Lower Bavaria, Carinthia, and Tyrol led to the reconciliation breaking down. This soon led to fighting, although on a small scale, mostly confined to border skirmishes. In 1342, Clement VI was elected pope, and he was determined to bring Ludwig down. To do so, he decided to cultivate the support of the Luxembourgs, as the most powerful family already hostile to the emperor. Among other things, Clement raised the Bishop of Prague to the rank of Archbishop, which gave Bohemia much more control over its church. As tensions between Wittelsbach and Luxembourg continued to rise, Ludwig continued his policy of land grabbing. In 1345, with the death of the Aven Count of Haino, Holland, and Zealand, he bestowed the counties onto his wife Margaret, the late Count's sister. This act angered Margaret's sisters, who also had a claim on the counties, but it also explains why, in our narrative, at the moment, these counties are ruled by the House of Bavaria, as Count Albert is a son of Ludwig and Margaret. In 1346, Ludwig's unpopularity reached a breaking point, and John's son Charles was elected King of Germany by the Archbishop electors, the Duke of Saxony, and his father, with the support of the papacy. Now I don't want to overstate Ludwig's unpopularity. Upon the election of Charles, the Bavarian was in a much stronger position than the Luxembourger, and Charles's position only got weaker in 1346 with the Battle of Cressy. Both Charles and his father John were present on the side of the French. 
By this point in his life, John had gone blind, but was still obsessed with knightly virtues. John fought in the vanguard, his horse being led by the reins, and demanding that he be brought to wherever the fighting was most fierce. Consequently, the king of Bohemia did not make it out of Cressy, and his death was mourned by the knights of Europe, even those fighting on the side of the English. His death was mourned far less in Bohemia itself, where he was never really popular and considered a foreigner king whose primary interests lay outside of the kingdom. With John's death, the crown of Bohemia passed to his son Charles, who managed to leave Cressy alive. So let's get introduced to Charles before we delve into his time as king of Bohemia and Holy Roman Emperor. When he was born, Charles was given the name Wenceslas, a nod to the premise-led kings of Bohemia that his mother was descended from. When he was still a young child, his father sent him to the French court where he grew up. In Paris, he adopted the name Charles, a nod to King Charles IV of France, who was also his uncle. The House of Luxembourg remained close to the French royal family, even after the transition from direct Capetian to Valois. Shortly after Philip VI became king, his son John was married to John of Bohemia's daughter Bonn. This of course means that Philip the Bold is the grandson of John of Bohemia and the nephew of Charles. Anyways, after spending several years in France, Charles was reunited with his father and accompanied him to Italy. After John's Italian expedition, Charles returned to Bohemia, where he took over the day-to-day -day administration of the kingdom as his father began to go blind. At this point, he was made Margrave of Moravia, one of the territories held by the crown of Bohemia, a title which indicated his position as heir to Bohemia as a whole, more so than a specific role as the ruler of Moravia. After some years gaining experience as a ruler, Charles was elected King of Germany in opposition to Ludwig. The stage was now set for a civil war, and Charles's position was not strong. However, he was saved by disaster by Ludwig's unexpected death while hunting in 1347. After Ludwig's death, the Wittelsbach and their supporters tried to elevate a king in opposition to Charles, but without much success. Charles was able to win over many Wittelsbach allies and marginalize the others, and so about two years after the Bavarian's death, Charles was the undisputed king of Germany. But for most of his life, Charles's focus was on the politics of Bohemia rather than those of the empire. Still though, the cultivation of Bohemia helped Charles's own position as king and later emperor greatly. Over a century later, the Habsburg emperor Maximilian I would call Charles the stepfather of the empire, playing on the phrase father of the fatherland, which was a common motif in imperial styling, and pointing out that the affairs of the empire always seemed to take a backseat to those of Bohemia. But historian Ivan Lavacek pushes back against this claim, quote, Although Charles was quickly dubbed the stepfather of the empire by those in favor of a strong centralized monarchy, and was accused of always favoring his own native domain, a reassessment of his reign leads to more even-handed conclusions. For it was not possible to wield influence in the empire without the sovereign having a solid base in his own domain, which would command respect and guarantee the balance of power. While John had never been quite at home in Bohemia, Charles thought of Bohemia rather than Luxembourg as his native land. Charles's mother was a premise-led princess, and he actually spoke Czech, unlike his father. But Charles could not ignore the empire, nor could he the imperial title. Just as Dante encouraged his grandfather, Henry VII, to restore imperial rule to Italy, many of the great Italian intellectuals of the day, like Petrarch, did the same to Charles. But Charles, learning from his grandfather's and father's mistakes, decided not to get bogged down in Italy. He came, he saw, he was crowned, then he left. Much to the disappointment of the Ghibellines and the relief of the Guelphs. Shortly after becoming emperor, Charles promulgated the Golden Bull of 1356. This proclamation fixed the electors of the Holy Roman Emperor as the archbishops of Mainz, Trier, and Cologne, the King of Bohemia, the Count Palatine of the Rhine, the Duke of Saxony, and the Margrave of Brandenburg. Furthermore, to deal with contested claims to votes, Charles assigned those votes to whichever party was friendlier to him at the moment, and proclaimed that going forward the lay electorates were to be indivisible and inherited through primogeniture. Finally, the Golden Bull established that having a majority of the votes was enough to be elected king, while in the past three electors could conspire to throw a wrench in the proceedings. Furthermore, the Golden Bull gave the electors rights over their territories that other imperial princes did not have, further heightening the prestige of the vote. The Golden Bull also established the practice of holding annual meetings between the emperor and the electors. 
The Golden Bull would be the fundamental organization of the Holy Roman Empire until it was dissolved in 1806 during the Napoleonic Wars, 450 years later. The Golden Bull is generally seen as transforming the Holy Roman Empire into one run by aristocratic oligarchy rather than monarchic autocracy. In making this change, Charles was trading the theoretical power of the emperor for stability. And furthermore, the majority of the Golden Bull was based on codifying precedent and clarifying procedure rather than any innovations. It was mostly putting into writing what was already being done. And so, as the emperor was now the preeminent prince, Charles continued his father's policy of expanding Bohemia to further build up his personal power and work to strengthen the power of the Bohemian king. Charles completed the incorporation of Silesia into the Bohemian crown lands, and furthermore purchased Lusatia and used dynastic politics to gain control of the electorate of Brandenburg. By the end of his life, Charles ruled a huge chunk of territory on the eastern side of the empire. He did not, however, rule Luxembourg. In 1353, Charles gave control of Luxembourg, which he also raised from a county to a duchy, to his half-brother Wenceslas, who was married to Joan, soon to be Duchess of Brabant. I've already mentioned Wenceslas and Joan's conflict with Louis of Mala, so I won't dive into it again here, and there's honestly not too much to say about Wenceslas's time as Duke of Luxembourg that I haven't already covered in a previous episode. So before we return to Bohemia and the rest of the empire, I want to quickly delve into Charles's relationship with France. At this point in time, despite the initial setbacks in the Hundred Years' War and the ravages of the Black Death, France was still the power in Europe. Charles, while a friend of the French court, was wary of French expansion into the empire. When Dauphiné was sold to the royal family, Charles was not in a position to resist the sale, but he did take action to make sure that its neighbors would remain imperial in the near future. Also, if we go back to episode 6, we see Charles IV conferring the county of Burgundy onto Philip. While this act may seem counterintuitive, it was clear to everyone that Philip would gain control of the Franche Comte eventually, so by conferring it to Philip, Charles reasserted the emperor's ability to do so, and ensured that it would remain an imperial fief. French expansion into the empire was on the minds of many French and German princes, and as the Dukes of Burgundy gain more imperial territory, they will begin to face pushback from those unwilling to allow more of the empire to fall into the hands of this French dynasty. But that's still for the future. For now, Charles was using his experience growing up in Paris as inspiration for his own capital. Under Charles IV, Prague was expanded and aggrandized as a new town was built near the old town. Charles also patronized many new building projects in and around Prague throughout his reign, including castles, fortresses, churches, and more. But his greatest contribution to the city was the founding of a university. Now known as the Charles University, the school is the oldest in the Czech Republic and at the time quickly became a major center of knowledge and learning. The emperor recruited scholars and theologians from all around Europe, but especially from Paris and Italy. And Charles himself was no intellectual slouch. He wrote an autobiography as well as many treatises on law and religion. Under Charles IV, Prague became a center of arts and culture and the court of the Luxembourgs was one of the finest in Europe. But Charles could not spend all of his time in Prague. He was constantly on the move to deal with this or that. Not only was his family dynastic rivals with the Habsburgs and the Wittelsbachs, but he also had to worry about the neighboring kings of Poland and Hungary. Charles was a man who tended to prefer diplomacy to warfare, unlike his father, and luckily for him he was quite skilled at it. The emperor was able to pacify the Habsburgs and marginalize the Wittelsbachs through marriage and alliance. Furthermore, he arranged for his second son, Sigismund, to marry the heir to Hungary and established a tree of friendship with the Polish king. But we should not be under the impression that Charles's reign was without conflict. All of the parties mentioned above fought with the Luxembourgers several times before they were pacified. Still though, Charles's time as King of Germany and later Emperor marked a period of stability, and in order to continue that stability, Charles made sure that during his lifetime, his oldest son Wenceslas was elected King of Bohemia and King of Germany. Charles IV, Holy Roman Emperor, died in 1378 at age 62, and his lands were split between his sons and nephew. The 17-year-old Wenceslas assumed the responsibilities of the crown of Bohemia and of Germany, which he had been invested with years earlier. Meanwhile, Sigismund was invested with the Margraviate of Brandenburg and was sent to the court of Hungary to learn about his future kingdom. 
Charles's youngest son, John, was given the Duchy of Gorlitz, more on that in the future episode, and Charles's nephew, Josht, had inherited Moravia from his father a few years earlier. While Wenceslas had been well prepared for his future as King of Germany and Bohemia by his father, he proved to be a very different ruler than Charles. First of all, the unity of the Luxembourgs themselves was hurt in the partitioning of their territories. When Charles was alive, he still had some influence over the lands given to his brothers, but Wenceslas did not have the force of will or command of respect to keep that influence, and so his territorial base was already smaller than that of his father's. The king would inherit Luxembourg from his uncle a few years later, but the duchy was far from the center of the House of Luxembourg's world at this point, and did little to help Wenceslas's position. Furthermore, Wenceslas's weaker personality allowed for him to be dominated by his advisors. This contributed both to an increase of corruption in Bohemia, and to an estrangement between Wenceslas and the nobles of Bohemia not in the king's inner circle. To make matters worse, he also suffered from debilitating alcoholism, which further eroded his reputation and his ability to get anything done. In 1388, as the king was trapped for cash due to all the corruption interfering with tax collection, he pawned the Duchy of Luxembourg to his cousin Josht. And in 1394, Josht helped to lead a noble revolt against Wenceslas. The king was arrested for two years until his brothers Sigismund and John arranged a peace. While Josht was actively fighting against Wenceslas, Sigismund was alternating between helping and harming his brother. Although not secure enough on his Hungarian throne to fully oppose Wenceslas, Sigismund was constantly giving subtle support to his brother's enemies. Due to his slipping grip on Bohemia, Wenceslas rarely left the kingdom. This would be all fine and good if not for the fact that he had additional responsibilities as king of Germany. While Charles was constantly on the move, Wenceslas was considered an absent king by many in the empire outside of Bohemia. As in Bohemia, many issues were facing the Holy Roman Empire, but Wenceslas seemed to be content to let them all play out. He was not at all helped by the outbreak of the Western Schism right as he assumed power, and every day that the Schism continued, more people seemed to blame him for not solving it. It seemed that every day, Wenceslas' reputation got worse and worse. And so we'll leave off for now, in 1396, with Wenceslas freed from his imprisonment, but by no means in a comfortable position. Thank you so much for listening, and thank you to my patrons. Christine, Comte de Chenonceau, Elliot, Graf von Gravenstein, Anthony, Comte de Chateauneuf von Auxois, and James, Graf von Temse. And thank you to my Knights of the Duchy. If you want to join them, you can at patreon.com slash Burgundy. If you want to support the podcast in other ways, you can do so by leaving a review on your podcast app of choice and telling your friends about the show. Both really help to grow the show and will earn you my everlasting appreciation. If you want to keep up with the show, you can follow me at Valois Burgundy on Twitter or find Grand Dukes of the West on Facebook. You can also email me at granddukesofthewest at gmail.com and check out the podcast website for maps, images, sources, and more at granddukesofthewest.com. Once again, thank you for listening.